everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the Emeritus Chair of the Astronomy Department at Foothill College. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this remotely controlled program in the 21st year of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. Uh, these pro this whole program is co-sponsored by four distinguished organizations, the Foothill College, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Division, the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the University of California Observatories, which includes the Lick Observatory, the first uh, permanently uh, inhabited uh, mountaintop observatory in the world. And all these organizations contribute to the publicity and to finding uh, distinguished lecturers like the one we have tonight. Um, I want to remind you that if you are viewing this on YouTube, uh, we do encourage you to ask questions during the first airing of the program. And that uh, email through which you ask questions will flash below. It's astronomy at foothill.edu. So we encourage you to leave questions. If you're viewing a rerun of this later than May 26, of course, it's too late to ask questions. Now, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Adam Frank is a leading expert on the final stages in the life of stars like the sun. But his current work also focuses on life in the universe. His research group at the University of Rochester has developed advanced supercomputing tools for studying how stars form and how planets evolve. He is also a popular author. His most recent book is Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds and the Fate of the Earth, which won the 2019 Phi Beta Kappa Award for Science. He has written two other popular books, The Constant Fire, Beyond the Religion and Science Debate, and About Time, Cosmology and Culture at the Twilight of the Big Bang. Dr. Frank is the co-founder of the blog 13.8 on bigthink.com and an on-air commentator for NPR's All Things Considered. He's also contributed pieces to the New York Times, NBC, the Washington Post, and other media. And amidst all this scientific and popularization work, he found time to serve as the science consultant for Marvel's film, Doctor Strange. Frank's work in public outreach was recently honored via the American Physical Society's 2020 Joseph A. Burton Forum Award. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me now to introduce Dr. Adam Frank, giving us a little talk about aliens techno signatures and the new science of life in the universe. Dr. Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be with everyone. Um, let me share my screen so we can get started here. And we'll go there and we'll push that button. There we go, we're getting started. So greetings everyone from the uh, deck of the Rosinate here behind me. Um, my favorite show, The Expanse. You should watch it if you're not watching it. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk, uh, uh, giving you a little talk about aliens. I want really what I want to do today is uh, talk about the. Um, let me start my timer here so I don't go on too long. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about is where we are in thinking about life in the universe, particularly thinking about uh, intelligent life in the universe. Um, so here's a little uh, table of contents. It's always good to know where you're going. Um, so what we're going to start with is a wee history, uh, a little bit about the what I would call the heroic age of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And then we're going to talk about the exoplanet revolution, which has really changed everything in thinking about life in the universe. And that uh, is going to lead us to thinking about what are called biosignatures. Um, and then that will lead to uh, this new phase in the history of uh, or thinking about intelligent life or exo-civilizations, as I like to call them. 
Uh, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time thinking about techno signatures and what's happening right now with this whole field. Um, and then finally, we're going to see how this all relates to us, what I call the astrobiology of the Anthropocene. What does the search for intelligent life in the universe have to do with what's happening to us right now, the particular crisis, uh, the climate crisis that we're in now? Okay, so let's start at the beginning, at the beginning of the modern age of thinking about intelligent life in the universe. And that starts in 1950 at Los Alamos National Labs when uh, four friends, four physicists are walking to lunch at the cantina and um, uh, the, the leading light among them is Enrico Fermi, a Nobel Prize winning physicist who was also just a super genius. Um, and then he had three friends, Edward Teller, Y. Kamenowski, uh, and Howard York. And they were, as they were walking to, the, um, to, the, to lunch, they, uh, the, I, uh, one of them recently had seen this cartoon in the New Yorker, which blamed uh, um, uh, the missing trash cans on UFOs. People had already, the, the UFO sightings had already begun. 1947 was when they began. And so that led to a story for, you know, led to a conversation as will happen with physicists about faster than light travel and aliens and, you know, civilizations. And then they forgot about it. The conversation went elsewhere to other topics in science. And then, you know, an hour later over lunch, Fermi suddenly blurts out, but where are they? Right. And all of the friends laughed because they knew this was Fermi. This was Fermi capturing immediately the essence of the problem. And for him, the problem here was like, well, look, if there are civilizations forming everywhere across the universe or across the galaxy and they can travel even close to the speed of light, um, then why aren't they here right now? So that was kind of the first time this question about alien or alien intelligence is going to be posed by a scientist in a way that's going to have that's going to resonate. Um, so then we now uh, go eight years uh, in the future and we have Frank Drake, the great hero of SETI, who in 1958 is a young man, there he is, and he gets hired by the uh, Green Bank Radio, National Radio Observatory. Um, and uh, you know he uh, convinces his, his fellow researchers, it's a small team there, that hey, can we maybe use this giant antenna we have to look for signals um, of, of other civilizations. And so, you know, uh, it doesn't, they're, they're, they're willing. And so he does an actual search. They, they design the detectors they need and they search for um, a number, uh, for signals from a number of close by solar type stars. They don't find anything, but it gets lots of attention. The press descend on them. You know, this captures the imagination of, uh, uh, of the world. And it's the first true search for uh, um, extraterrestrial intelligence, other civilizations. And then a couple of years later, so after this, Frank Drake will say that, you know, he was kind of like looking over his shoulders, wondering who was gonna be laughing at him for doing this. Um, but in fact, actually what he gets a call, he gets a call from the National Academy of Sciences asking him to lead a meeting with the topic interstellar communications. And this is a fascinating story of how this meeting came together. They pulled together uh, uh, um, Drake and the head of the National Academy of Sciences Space Division, pulled together a list of seven people, uh, all of whom, you know, have some interest. Uh, and this, uh, there's the list, uh, Sagan, Otto Struva, uh, and others. Um, and the idea of the meeting is, you know, somehow they're, you know, they want to talk about the possibilities, what's involved. If we want to think about you know, finding other intelligences, how do we break the problem up? And the most important result of this comes from Frank Drake just trying to set the agenda. How will we actually organize this meeting? How will we organize what we want to talk about? And out of that comes the famous Drake equation. And so let's just run through, many of you may have seen this before, but let's just run through what the Drake equation says, what it's about. Basically what we're interested, what Drake was interested in is how many civilizations are there out there that you could that we could communicate with, that might be sending us messages. So that's N, the number of civilizations. And he broke this up into seven factors. Each one is gonna be a different problem. So the first one is the rate of star formation, how often stars are forming. The next term, F sub P, is the fraction of those stars that have planets. The next uh, 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 term is going to be the number of planets if they exist, uh, that are in the right place for life to form, what we call the habitable zone, where um, the planet is not too hot and not too cold so life could form. The next term is the fraction of those planets where life evolves. The next term is the fraction of that life that goes on to become intelligent. 
The next term is the fraction of that intelligence that goes on to develop a technological civilization. And then finally, the last term is the lifetime of those civilizations. So what Drake did with this equation, and it became, you know, it just, it, it changed the way we think about this problem. Because what he did was, what was brilliant about this, is he broke this very hard problem into a seven smaller hard problems, some of which you could imagine trying to solve. Um, so for example, at the time of the, uh, of when he proposed this equation, R sub star, which is the rate of star formation, people were already getting a handle on that. All the rest of the terms, nobody knew, but at least R sub star already, they had gotten their handle on. So this was a big uh, moment in, the, in, in SETI, in the history of SETI. Also another important moment comes when 1960, when physicist Freeman D Dyson proposes that, you know, may, one thing that an advanced civilization might do is try and capture all of the energy from their star to do amazing things. And they would do this by, you know, surrounding their star with a, you know, he, a, a sphere that would have solar collectors on the inside. And this way they could harness the entire energy that, you know, the, uh, the, the cataclysmic energies involved in uh, uh, a star. Um, so, you know, this idea is going to resonate also through the whole history of SETI. So uh, the, the idea of Dyson spheres is going to be something that is going to find its way, you know, through studies for the next, until now. Another important uh, um, uh, milestone in this was the uh, development by of the, what's called the Kardashev scale. And here is Kardashev, he was a Soviet physicist. And he came up with this idea that if you want to detect civilizations, you want to, what you want to do is you want to think about how they would use energy. And so he had these, this idea of the Kardashev, Kardashev scale for civilizations where there were three different types a type one civilization would use all the power that fell on the planet. So, you know, in some sense, you could imagine covering your planet in solar panels, right? Um, a type two civilization would use all of the pow power available from the home star. In some sense, they would, they would cover the star or surround the star with a Dyson sphere, right? A type three civilization would use all the power available from all the stars in a galaxy. And this Kardashev scale, this idea Echo is going to echo down, um, uh, you know, for the rest of of, of history and thinking about um, uh, uh, SETI. So these are these sort of seminal ideas that are being put into place in this classic era of SETI that will have, you know, that will really guide our thinking. Um, Another important moment was when Fermi's question that he asks actually becomes uh, what we now call formally the Fermi's Fermi's paradox. Um, and this actually came from a paper by Hart in 1975. And what he realized was that, that if, if you had even a single civilization that had the capacity to send out probes, you know, slower than light probes uh, or, 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 or settlement ships, colonizing ships, that actually um, the, the time it would take for these ships to hop from one uh, star system to another was even if they were traveling at say a 10th of the speed of light, was uh, very short compared to the age of the galaxy. In fact, he calculated it and found the time for this colonization wave to spread across the galaxy was about 600,000 years, which is way shorter than the billions of years, the 10 billion years, which is the age of the galaxies. So from this, he derived a very important for him conclusion. So what he figured was, since this time is so short, the settlement front or the colonization front from anywhere in the galaxy should have spread over the earth by now. It should, it will have contacted, it will have spread over the earth. Um, and so he called, he then said, he then proposed fact A as he called it, which said, look, there's no settlers here now. So what that must mean is there's no settlers anywhere. There's no other civilizations other than our own. We are alone. So this fact A uh, became the Fermi paradox. The paradox part is that, well, you know, there should be civilizations everywhere. We don't see any, so therefore we're alone, okay? Now, 
Others uh, rebutted this. There were a number of papers that tried to respond to Hart, uh, including by Sagan and collaborators. And what there, everybody was sort of focusing on this idea that like, well, this settlement wave, this expansion wave of ships hopping from one star system to the other and settling those, uh, the planets in that star system, that, you know, maybe that front stalls or it stops for some reason. So it just, it never reached us. That's why we don't, there's no one here now is because it never reached us. So that was an ongoing debate. And we're going to come back to this uh, later on. Um, now, there was, it turns out that as time as people started talking about this, there, there came to be what was called, there was another version of the Fermi paradox that people talked about. Um, and this was the idea that there was this great silence. So this other Fermi paradox, remember that the first Fermi paradox is why aren't they here now? Why don't I see any aliens when I walk around? Uh, why aren't they, you know, why aren't there already, you know, uh, uh, buildings that the aliens live in? So that was a, a, like the idea of direct detection. We would actually see them. Indirect detection, the idea that, you know, okay, uh, Frank Drake is looking with a radio telescope and he doesn't see anything. Um, people came to say, people came to, to think that, well, we've done SETI searches and we haven't found anything. So there is, therefore is this great silence or um, uh, so David Brin came up with that term, the great silence. And it was the, 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 the presupposition was here that we've looked enough uh, with our SETI searches of distant galaxies or distant stars and we haven't found anything. So therefore there must be a great silence. And along with that came the idea of the great filter. And the great filter was the idea that, well, the reason we don't find any other civilizations is because there must be something in the evolution of life that keeps the civilizations from either getting to our point or even if they get further, that cuts them off. So there's some filter, evolutionary filter that keeps advanced civilizations from, from forming. So this has been discussed again and again. And again, we're also gonna look at this at the end, uh, you know, as we get towards the end of the talk. Um, and so then in the seventies, what we get is, you know, there was Frank Drake uh, and the people who were involved with him. They were the first generation, the real pioneers of SETI. But then comes this second generation of, you know, it's like 10 years later, 15 years later, and you get people like Jill Tarter and Woody Sullivan, who was uh, a professor of mine at the University of Washington, who was a radio astronomer who was also interested in setting. He's the one who introduced me to it. And then Seth Shostak and others. Um, and, uh, you know, they were the ones who really, you know, they, they, they picked up the ball, uh, you know, with immense courage because the field still, you know, there was still what we were going to call the giggle factor. And what's really amazing, you know, all of them, they were all courageous, but we have to really give a shout out to Jill Tarter, because as we've learned over the last 10 years, um, what women in science have to put up with uh, from their male colleagues, you know, everything from, uh, you know, from sexual harassment to just being, you know, ignored. And here comes Jill Tarter, who is just going to take on the most controversial subject in the field. And like a pit bull is going, you know, jaws are going to lock on and she's just going to, you know, with, with intrepid scientific intuition and skills, it's just going to, you know, go ahead, plow ahead and not be stopped. So, you know, we, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Jill Tarter, as well as these others. Um. So, so, uh, so, you know, we're, we're kind of concluding an important piece of the history. I just wanted to give you the background because the ideas that come from this era are going to resonate through with what's happening now. Um, but let's end this, uh, this little section with um, where things stood by sort of the mid 80s or the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and um, one of the things people really wanted to do was build like this giant, they called it Cy Project Cyclops. They were going to build this immense radio telescope that was going to be sensitive enough and powerful enough to detect, to try and detect uh, 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 signals from distant stars. Um, but you can also ask, uh, why was there this emphasis on radio? Like during this epoch, really SETI is about radio. And there's reasons for that, scientific reasons. One was sensitivity, the radio um, uh, was, was going to be particularly sensitive um, and also particularly sensitive across, uh, across, you know, from one end of the galaxy to the other. Optical wavelengths, visual light gets obscured by dust in the galaxy. So you really can't see from one end of the galaxy to the other. Radio waves, because the, they're longer, can actually penetrate that or get through those clouds of dust. And so um, radio was the natural way of thinking. Um, but no matter what, uh, it, you know, with radio or anything, it's going to be a challenging search. And particularly because, um, uh, 
you know, at this time, nobody knew where to look, right? So the basic search strategy, well, you know, so, so the challenge here was you didn't know where to look, which stars should you look at? Okay, sun like stars, great. That still leaves, you know, a lot of stars. You don't know when should you look, you know, uh, you know, when are messages emitted? How often should I look? You know, uh, what frequency should I look with? Should I look every hour? Should I look every day? Should I look every month? Um, and you really don't know what to look for. What kind of signal am I looking for? So the bet, the best bet that people were sort of pushing for was the idea of beacons, that someone was going to send you a purposeful message. The idea was that an advanced civilization would want others to know that they existed. So they would send a, you know, a powerful uh, 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 message beamed um, into space that could then be detected. And we're going to see how different that is from uh, you know some of the possibilities that are available now. But we're really gonna end this uh, little history on a sad note because what happens to SETI in 1978 is that uh, you know NASA was prepared to do a big project, to fund a big project, and then Senator William Proxmire uh, names the NASA SETI project, he gives it what he called the Golden Fleece Award, which he awarded to projects that he said were a waste of time. Right, and of course, this gets a lot. You know, we shouldn't give money for to find little green men, um, and so NASA is literally not allowed to fund SETI. Right, if NASA is told you cannot fund SETI, then in the 1990s, NASA tries again to fund some SETI pro, uh, programs in the early 90s, and once again, NASA steps in because this is a great thing for congressmen at the time, you know, to make some headlines, you know, and look like they're being, you know, budget hawks. So, for example, Congressman Conti says, "Why should I spend? Why should we spend millions on SETI when, for seventy-five cents, I can buy a tabloid and see pictures of aliens?" That's not a direct quote, but it's kind of like the quote. And then Senator Richard B Bryan cuts all the funding for these projects and says, "This will hopefully be the end of Martian hunting season at the taxpayers' expense." So NASA gets burned. NASA really gets burned, and you know, uh, you know, there becomes. You know, so this is not an official history, but you know, my sense is, is that NASA really just doesn't wants to stay away from this because every time they try and get near it, you know, Congress just jumps all over them. So this is really what the, the funding for NASA for, for SETI dries up. Other than a few uh, uh, people who are willing, a few private donors, there's just no money for SETI anymore. That means no graduate students, no postdocs. The field really goes, enters a period of, of you know, great difficulty. But nature, and science had other plans, as we shall see. So let's talk about exoplanets. So there's this question that has been around for 2,500 years. And that question is, are there any other stars that have planets? And you can actually see this question coming up over and over again. So for example, Aristotle and Democritus had a big fight about this, and you can see them yelling at each other. Uh, where Aristotle was like, we're the, you know, the Earth is the only planet, and it's the only planet that could have life. There's no other planet like it anywhere. And Democritus was like, no, 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 you know, uh, I believe in atoms, and atoms, you know, uh, fill the, the universe, and they take many different forms. So there should be lots of planets with lots of different kinds of life, right? Um, and then, you know, sometime around, uh, you know, I mean, the debate goes on during the medieval period. Around in the mid-1700s, uh, there's a renewed interest and there begins to be a sense that there should be planets orbiting other stars. And so this is the front piece of a famous um, dialogue that De Fontenelle writes, uh, which shows all these little circles here are actually other stars with other planetary systems, right? Um, and then, for example, so the hunt gets on. As astronomy, modern astronomy is born, telescopes get better. People are always hunting for planets. And many a career in astronomy was ruined by the claim to find a planet. So, for example, in 18, in the, somewhere around the 1890s, this is uh, J. Thomas C., who was an astronomer um, who everybody hated. Very interesting story. Nobody liked this guy because he was a jerk. But And he claimed to have discovered uh, uh, exoplanets, that he, he, he claimed to find uh, evidence for planets orbiting other stars. He was completely wrong. He never admitted, and that contributed to his downfall. So anyway, exoplanets, the idea of planets orbiting other stars is an ancient question, right? And um, and the interesting thing was, is that, uh, you know, as in the modern era, as technology got better, particularly driven by the SETI folks, there was a push at NASA 
to try and develop the instruments that you would need to be able to detect exoplanets, what we're going to call exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. So in particular, there are these two meetings, and this is the um, uh, one of the reports from them in 1978 and 1979, driven in large part by the SETI community to, you know, what do we need to do to develop the technologies? What, what are those technologies for detecting planets? Um, so this was a huge, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, push to, you know, it's, they knew it was going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort to figure this out. And the reason why the SETI community was interested in this is we, if we go back to the Drake equation, the second two terms in the Drake equation are about planets. F sub P is the fraction of planets or the fraction of stars that have planets. N sub E is the number of, you know, if you have a star that actually has planets, N sub E is the average number of planets in the right place for life to form. So this is why the SETI community was so interested in this. So what happens is eventually in 1995, OMG, we find planets. We find, you know, the 1995, 96 is when we find the first planet orbiting a sun-like star. Um, and that the, the, the dam is broken. And when you think about it, how often in life does a 2,500 year old question get answered, right? But in our lifetime, or at least, you know, those of us who are around then, um, the question has been answered. We now know definitively that there are other planets orbiting other stars. And in particular, there is the Kepler mission, which was launched in, um, you know, about 10, uh, 15 years ago or so, that just, um, uh, you know, just really started finding planets wholesale. And so now we're at the point where not only do we know lots of planets, we also know that there are planets, we found planets in their so-called habitable zone, planets that might be, or the planets are in the right place for life to form. And so now actually we've discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets. And this is an interesting plot. This is a plot of the size of planets relative to the earth. And this is their orbital period in days. So remember the earth has an orbital period of 365 days. So the earth is here. This is one earth radius. So the earth is uh, somewhere right around here. And what you see is we have found lots and lots of planets and lots of all you know, planets of different types. We found things like Jupiter, you know, cold, large planets. We found hot, you know, planets like Jupiter, planets that are Jupiter sized, but are like parked right up against their star. We have found worlds that, that we found planets that are, uh, we don't even have in our own solar system, what are called uh, super Earths. Um, uh, we have found lots of rocky planets. That's great. We found rocky planets that are so close to their star that literally they're molten rock. Um, and uh, uh, the, the real frontier is actually finding more Earth-like planets on Earth-like orbits. Uh, but we certainly have found planets in the right place for life to form because the habitable zone, the size of the habitable zone depends on the kind of star. So for smaller stars, the habitable zones are smaller, um, closer to the star, and we definitely found lots of those. Okay, so this was the exoplanet revolution. We now know lots and lots and lots about planets orbiting other stars. But there were a couple other revolutions that happened that were also going to be important for now where we are in thinking about uh, other planets and life and exo-civilizations. So one of them was the fact that we have now sent robots to every kind of body in the solar system. Every planet has been visited, every type of, of asteroid and comet. Um, not all, they, not, we haven't visited every asteroid, but all the main types have been already been visited. And so this picture, here's an interesting picture. You look at this picture and that could be the Mojave Desert or something, but it's not, it's Mars. We, Mars is now a planet that is entirely inhabited by robots, okay? Um, and these robots have been trundling around for a while, taking pictures and drilling holes and things. Um, and one of the things we've learned from this exploration of Mars is that Mars was most likely a blue world for a while. That it, you know, Mars experienced climate change. It used to have a very different climate where there was liquid water on its surface. Now there's lots of questions about the state of that, but we're, we're absolutely sure that there was liquid water rushing around on the surface of Mars. So by studying our, everything in our solar system, we also learned an enormous amount about how planets work. And then the other revolution that we need to note is studying the Earth, or what we call the Earth systems. And the Earth systems are the oceans, the hydrosphere, 
the ice, the cryosphere, the, um, uh, the lithosphere, the rock, and then the biosphere. And we've been able to map out the entire 4.5 billion year history of the earth. You know, some things we know better than others, but we know pretty well about the fundamental changes that the earth has gone through. So, you know, I like this little diagram that shows you, these are all the different eras of the earth going from the Archean, you know, uh, uh, billions of years ago, um, all the way up to the Holocene where we are now. So I always like to show this picture and ask people, because this sort of prove, you know, sort of makes my point about what we've learned from the Earth's history uh, relevant to studying other planets is, here's the question, which of these is the Earth? So I'll give you a minute to think about it. And some of you may know. The answer is all of them. So these are six different uh, representations of the different planets that the Earth has been through its history. So here we have the Earth right after it formed and it was literally uh, had a molten ocean. Um, this is the earth early on before continents formed. So con there weren't always continents. Earth was a, 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 a water world with sort of small islands. There's also been times when there's been, the earth has been so hot that there's been no ice pretty much anywhere. So we've been a jungle world. There's been other times when we were almost entirely ice, what we call snowball earth phases. Um, and then here's the earth now, our happy little planet. Uh, and then, unfortunately, in another billion years or so, the um, planet, the sun is going to heat up to the point where um, the oceans will evaporate. So be careful about your long-term investments. Okay. All right. So we had this exoplanet revolution, which now showed us that there are planets everywhere. Uh, we also had the revolution of studying our own solar system and studying the Earth. What does that do for us? What does it do for SETI? Well, first of all, the Drake equation, it gives us new data that we didn't have. So in particular, remember this equation. Now we know that term 100%. We know that term 100%. We have nailed where we started off with only knowing one term in the Drake equation. The exoplanet revolution has tripled our uh, what we know about uh, the, these terms, right? So we know that F sub P is one. Every star in the sky has a family of worlds orbiting it. That's incredible. Tonight, when you walk outside, look up, Every one of those stars has a family of worlds. They're all places. You can stand on them, or at least, you know, a lot of them. Um, you know, the, 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 a lot of them are going to have oceans and snow falling and mountaintops and wind blowing, okay? Um, we also know what N sub E is. It's around one-fifth or so. This keeps getting updated, but it's around one-fifth, which means that basically count up five stars when you look tonight. One of them is going to have a planet in the right place for life to form, okay? So that's huge. Now, what can you do with that? Well, in 2016, uh, Woody Sullivan and I wrote a paper that showed by sort of manipulating the Drake equation, you could answer one particular kind of question. You could ask yourself, what is the probability that we're the only time in cosmic history that life uh, and civilizations have formed? And so what you learn from the Drake, this new form of the Drake equation is that well, you know, there's basically 10 to the 22 or 10 billion trillion planets in the universe, right? So what are the odds that, that you know, if, if, if each one of those planets constitutes an experiment that nature ran in the evolution of life and the evolution of civilizations, what are the odds that none of them ever formed a civilization? Well, that would be one over 10 to the minus 22 or one in 10 billion trillion. So here's how we call this the pessimism line, because it turns out if now we don't know what nature actually sets for the odds that we don't know how, how evolution works on those, you know, in, in that way. But what we do know from this is that if nature chooses a probability per habitable zone planet of less than 10 to the minus 22 for civilizations to form, yep, then that's it, we're it. You've run out of planets, nobody else, there's no other life existing. On the other hand, if the probability that nature has set through evolution is greater than one in 10 billion trillion. And that's not that hard because one in 10 billion trillion is a very small number. If it's greater than that, then you know what? We're not the first time it's happened. Now I can't say whether or not there's anyone else around now, but I can say that as long as nature, as long as the probability that nature sets is greater than 10 to the minus 22, then there have been other experiments in civilizations. And for me, what this means is, is that 
you know, uh, uh, um, unless nature's really, really biased against life and civilizations, because that 10 to the minus, that's what that 10 to the minus 22 would mean, then uh, unless it's really biased against it, then this has happened before. Now, that's not, that's not a concrete argument, but anyway, that's just an argument by, you know, by sort of, you know, playing with numbers, but, but at least now we have a number to play with, right? We didn't have that before. Okay, so now we can get to say, now we can enter the modern era and ask, what does the exoplanet revolution change for SETI uh, in particular, you know, in, in terms of what we're going to do? And here's the most important thing. We've got all these planets. We now know exactly where to look, right? We know which planets we should be focusing on the ones in the habitable zone, the ones that are in the right place for life to form. Um, so we know exactly where to look. And now, as I'm gonna show you, we're starting to learn exactly what we should look for, okay? So let's begin to think about this. So let's talk about biosignatures. So a biosignature is what scientists call, um, what, they, what they're referring to is the imprint of an exobiosphere in the atmospheric chemicals. Uh, that you can see via spectroscopy. So for example, in the, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, the only reason there's oxygen in the atmosphere is because of life. If all the life disappeared tomorrow, it would take some amount of time before the, uh, the oxygen would all react and combine with other chemicals and there'd be no life in the, uh, there'd be, sorry, there'd be no oxygen in the atmosphere, which means somebody looking from a distance could take a spectra of the light from Earth Break it up and look at what you know. Look at the the imprint, you know, the, um, the, the the finger, the chemical fingerprints that are in that light, and they'd see, um, um, you know, they if they looked at us now, they'd say, oh, there's oxygen in that atmosphere, and that could be a biosignature. That most likely indi indicates that there's life. There's a biosphere there producing that that um, uh, oxygen. So biosignatures are. The uh, the chemical fingerprints of 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 um, compounds, molecules, etc., that can that are produced by life. So things like methyl chloride, methyl bromide, these are all chemicals that life produced. That um, if you looked at a spectra, a spectra is when you take light and pass it through a prism and then uh, you know uh, do a readout of it. Any chemicals that are um, that are in the medium that is emitting or that the light is passing through are going to show up. They're going to have a fingerprint, what's called an absorption spectra, in that light. So you're using the light to look for signatures of chemicals uh, uh, from life in the planet's um, atmosphere. So that's what's called a biosignature. And so. You know, there's been an enormous amount of work since the exoplanet revolution. There's been an enormous amount of work on this. And uh, over time, what people have found is that, uh, you know, the Earth's biosignatures change. We've mapped this out of how, you know, during the early Earth, there's different biosignatures than during the Earth, uh, uh, what the Earth would look like now. So this is a really thriving business. So there, what I could call the rise of biosignature science. People have done an enormous amount of work now, and it's really sophisticated on what biosignatures we should look for, how not to be fooled by, you know, what we call false positives, et cetera. So biosignatures, are, is now a mature science and all the new telescopes that are going up, there's gonna be a huge component uh, of what they do, which will be looking for biosignatures. And that means now we enter the idea of techno signatures, right? So if NASA is already spending uh, and the NSF, et cetera, are spending a lot of money searching for biosignatures, which would be signatures of what we could call dumb life, like microbes. It's really microbes that are producing, that produce the oxygen in the atmosphere. Why exclude smart life, right? Remember that NASA sort of got burned by, by, by Congress. And so it was like, oh, I don't really want to do this anymore. Um, and they did some, they did some, but not the way, you know, many people would have wanted because they couldn't. Um, so, uh, uh, so but, but with the exoplanet revolution, NASA jumped all the way in with biosignatures. And so, you know, there was this sense of, well, what about techno signatures? What about signatures of technology? So what amazingly happens is, and the techno signatures was a, a, a name that uh, Jill Tarter gave to the idea that, look, if you're looking for biosignatures, technology will produce signatures as well. So amazingly in 2018, Congress adds, uh, puts language in the budget that says you should search for techno signatures. And uh, how this happened was Lamar Smith, the Congressman from Texas, who was the head of the Congressional Science Committee, who was actually a vehement climate denier uh, you know, which is strange. And if I ever get to talk to him, I'm going to ask him about that. But he was the one, you know, to his credit, it was like, yeah, you should be studying techno signatures. So NASA then holds in 2018 its first meeting 
on uh, techno signatures. And this was a momentous event in the field. And I was lucky enough uh, to be able to go to this. And it was like, everybody was like kids at a candy store. Oh my God, we're gonna get to talk about it. Cause what NASA was asking for was look, if we're gonna fund any of this, tell us what we should do. What are, what, you know, what kind of project should we be doing? And so what came out of that meeting was a, a rebirth of sort of thinking about life in the universe. I mean, other people obviously have been thinking about it a lot, but now there was a sense of the community of like, oh my God, there could really be some, 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 some funding to actually do something. And so one of the things that came out of this was like, for example, we started to think systematically about it in a new way. Um, so one of the things that came out of it was uh, this idea of, ha of, tech of figures of merit, axes of merit. If we're going to think about techno signatures, how should we do it? And so this was from Sophia Sheik. Uh, she did a, um, a paper where she sort of thought about, well, what are the things we should think about if we're thinking about techno signatures? Okay, well, can the search only be done in the future or can it be done now? Well, if it can be done now, that's the kind of thing you should do. Um, are we looking for techno signatures that are short-lived or long-lived from a civilization? Yeah, of course, you want long-lived. Are we looking for uh, things that are, don't have much information or have lots of information? So this was the beginning of sort of like, okay, look, we really want to try and put this field on a good, firm basis. How do we do it? And then, actually... The first grant got funded. It was that was a grant that I was the PI on. It was part of this team that you can see here uh, of lots of talented people, um, and we put in a proposal. And this was the first techno signature grant that NASA funded, um, and it funded to, uh, you know for two years. It's a two-year multi-institutional study to develop a library of atmospheric techno signatures. And it's very exciting. Um, and you know we're, we're now two years into it. I'm going to show you some of the results. And uh, we're now you know, looking at a renewal. And then some, there's been some other grants that have been funded as well. So it's a really, really exciting moment uh, in the field. Um, so let's now talk about what are techno signatures? What are some examples of techno signatures? Well, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. City lights or heat islands that might be, you might be able to see on a planet, large scale deployment of solar panels, atmospheric pollutants like uh, chlorofluorocarbons and orbiting megastructures. Uh, this picture here, this image here comes from a very large grant that we put in. Jason Wright was the PI of this. Didn't get funded, but you know, it sort of showed that the community is organizing itself to try and do you know, very ambitious things. And so we will put this grant in again the next time there's a chance uh, and hopefully that one will get funded. All right, so let's talk about some techno signatures. Here's one, alien megastructures, right? So this is the idea that um, you, know, you have large structures orbiting a star that you might be able to see as they pass in front of a star. So uh, the, the, the term for this is a Dyson swarm. So it's not a full Dyson sphere, but it's like a Dyson swarm. Uh, um, and uh, as these things pass in front of the star, you would see uh, uh, the, the starlight dim a little bit. Now, the amazing thing about this is we actually saw something pretty amazing in what was called uh, Boyan Star, um, where this is a this is uh, 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 what are called transits. This is the transit data from the Kepler telescope of uh, uh, Boyan Star, um, and you can see that it, it's like the light is just dipping up and down in very irregular ways, not at all like a planet uh, or like a yeah you know, a planet passing in front of the star. And so for a while, people were like totally perplexed by this. And, you know, uh, Jason Wright and others uh, in their paper um, suggested like, well, look, one of the things we have to at least consider is maybe these are alien megastructures. They had lots of other things to consider like comets, but, you know, uh, um, eventually we found that, uh, you know, our astronomers found that no, uh, you know, actually, um, you know, it's not alien megastructures, uh, you know, most likely it's uh, dust, balls of dust. But this just shows you, this is the kind of thing you would look for, you might find if you had orbiting megastructures. The other possibility, another techno signature are city lights. There are telescopes on the drawing boards right now that could be used to map features on an exoplanet. So the next generation of telescopes, uh, like the extremely large telescope, um, if say this is, this, this is a map of the earth, right? Looking with a telescope like this, you would be able to recover something of, you know, it'd be poor resolution, but of a map of, um, of you'd be able to see where the continents were. And you might even be able to see either city lights or heat islands with infrared of industrial centers. So that's, you know, that's not terribly far in the future. Um, if there were 
if you're uh, another techno signature would be if a, a civilization you know uses large scale um, solar energy collectors, then there's light reflected off those collectors and it would show up in the reflectance spectra from that planet. People have long known that the earth shows a very clear edge, they call it the red edge um, in the earth's reflectance spectra because of uh, plants. And so what um, Avi Loeb uh, and uh, Manasvi Lingam showed was that uh, solar panels would impose a, a sharp edge in the reflectance in the UV. So um, our group is actually trying to uh, uh, do more work with this right now. Uh, something, a paper we just, our group just produced um, uh, that Jacob Hak Mizra and Ravi uh, um, Kaparapu uh, have led is uh, what about, you know, let's just take, let's just start with a chemical that we know about on earth that could only be produced uh, by industry. And those are chlorofluorocarbons. These are the things that have to be banned because they have ozone, uh, 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 they cause problems for the ozone. But what um, uh, uh, Jacob and Ravi did and, their, and their, the other collaborators um, is they actually, you know, ran climate models. They ran three-dimensional models of a planet's climate, a planet orbiting a small star. Um, and they put, you know, different levels of, of chlorofluorocarbons in, either 1x or 10 times, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the level we have now, 10 times the level we have now, 100 times the level we have now. And then they let the climate settle um, because chlorofluorocarbons are actually, they heat, they're a great greenhouse gas. Um, so uh, they let the climate settle and then they took what we call synthetic spectra. They actually looked for what the light, the spectra of the, if we took a spectra of this planet, what would we see in the light? And what you see is this is the spectra. This is, um, uh, you can think of this as brightness or whatever versus wavelength. And right here, these, um, these lines right here, these come from the chlorofluorocarbons. And you can see that they really stand out, right? And most importantly, what we found is this plot takes a little bit of thinking about it, but what we found, what we looked for was how much signal signal would we be able to get if we observed um, uh, a planet, um, uh, uh, say, you know, like Proxima B, the, the clear, closest planet, using, um, uh, if we had 10 hours, 100 hours, 300 hours, 600 hours, 1200 hours of observing time for, you know, one of the telescopes that are about to go up. And what you find is in order for a firm detection, you need what they call the uh, signal to noise ratio to be greater than five. So that's five there. And what you find is, is that with just a hundred hours of observing time, you could get a clear indication, a clear detection of chlorofluorocarbons at earth's level um, with, with these telescopes. So this actually turns out to be a huge milestone for, uh, for techno signatures. Because what we've shown is that a, a civilization like Earth that had the same amount of CFCs that Earth has would be detectable with Earth levels of technology, meaning telescopes we have right now. So that was that was one of the, you know, that was actually a milestone to be able to show that's true. And not only that, it would require, this would require less time than observing some biosignatures. So this was huge. I mean, at least we consider this to be huge. And this paper hasn't been refereed yet, so who knows? But, you know, we feel confident in this conclusion. Um, so, you know, this is a techno signature, which, you know, with, with JWST even, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be launched next year, we, you know, should be able to, if we had enough time, if it was there, we would be able to detect it. Now, the other thing that happened with this new, you know, this renaissance of um, techno signatures is that we've been able to start thinking about the field again systematically. There's there's this new, you know, group of people, young people coming in and starting to ask questions about techno signatures, trying to really be systematic, to break it down in a way so that, you know, we kind of can figure out what we should do, what are the right directions to go in. So there's questions like what's the expected age of a civilization that we will likely detect? Is there really a Fermi paradox? How common are techno signatures? How, what's the lifetime of techno signatures? So I don't have much time left, but I'm gonna try and just take you through this, through some of this briefly. And I won't, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. But um, uh, uh, in a discussion with uh, the, the uh, uh, astronomer David Kipping, um, uh, Caleb Scharf and I, we were asking this question of, of you know, how uh, will, will most civilizations be older than us or younger than us? Um, and particularly the ones we detect, will they be uh, older or younger than us? 
And David Kipping, who is a very good mathematician, did some serious math kung fu using what's called Bayesian statistics. And he was able to show, I'm not going to go through this plot because it would take enough time, but he did the math and this plot reflects the math. And what he was able to show is that, you know, even if most civilizations are short lived, the ones we're going to detect, the ones we are most likely go are going to detect are going to be older than us. So that's really interesting because what it means is we're going to have to think about very long lived civilizations and what kind of techno signatures they're going to produce. And that's a real interesting challenge. Um, and so uh, so that's one thing that already has come out of this, you know, the, the techno signature studies. Now, another thing that's come out of trying to think systematically about it is uh, this possibility uh, the idea of freeing techno signatures from biosignatures. And what I mean by that is this. Um, there's a claim that made some people make that techno signatures must be shorter lived than biosignatures. You know, these, these imprints of these uh, signatures from technology, well, they're not going to be around as long as the signatures from biology, because of course, a technosphere, meaning, you know, the, 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 um, uh, a planet having all this technology around it, that should be a shorter lived planetary phase than a biosphere. Biospheres last billions of years, but we don't know how long civilizations last, you know, looking at ourselves, who knows, you know, maybe you only get a thousand years or so. However, there was this lovely paper by uh, Balbi and uh, Serkovic, which showed that really gave the really nice argument that look, techno spheres, meaning civilizations, are not techno signatures. What, what that means is a single civilization could last for, you know, uh, 10,000 years, but it could produce millions of techno signatures in the sense of like, what if it produced uh, uh, spaceships that would travel, you know, uh, uh, interstellar probes that were traveling from one place to the other, um, robot probes that such that even after the civilization died, these techno signatures would still be out there, perhaps still, you know, sending signals around in their robot ways. So there's a, you know, techno, sig techno signatures and civilizations they go together, but they don't have to go together. They don't have to be, uh, uh, they don't have to overlap in time forever, right? A civilization can produce techno signatures that then spread out and continue to live while the civilization dies. That was an important realization. Um, uh, and along with these lines is thinking about long-term techno signatures. Uh, one of the things we're working on right now is this idea of how do you think about these long-lived civilizations? And so what we're drawing into this is something called scenario analysis. Because uh, you could say like, oh my God, it's impossible. How do you possibly think about you know, long-term future? Well, you know, if you're working in climate studies, you have to think about long-term futures because, you know, you want to know what's going to happen 100 years from now, 200 years from now. What kind of technologies are we going to have? So there's a well-developed study that the IPCC, which is, you know, the people who study climate, use called scenario analysis. And we're going to apply this to, to uh, te the, the evolution of civilizations, because what you can imagine is if this is time, right, you have one possibility that civilization evolves and there's no new laws of physics. And really, they the civilization can never travel faster than the speed of light. Like basically, the laws of physics we know are the laws that we know now are the actual laws of physics. Well, if that's the case, then, um, uh, then the civilization is going to evolve a certain way. If there are no new laws, um, but you can have warp drives, which are a possibility in science fiction, um, uh, you know, uh, with Einstein theory of relativity, well, how does the civilization evolve in that case? So you can sort of lay out these scenarios. In a, um, and so that's something that's possible as well. So, all right, I don't want to spend a whole lot of more time on the rest of this. People can ask me questions about it, um, but I want to get, uh, uh, so I'll sort of sum up now because I don't want to go um, on too much longer. The one thing I want to leave you with, there's one thing I do want to leave you with is the Fermi paradox. So this is where we'll end, right? Remember I said that there was the indirect Fermi paradox, Fermi paradox, where people said, look, we've done all of these SETI searches and we haven't found anything. The, the, there's the great silence. But as uh, Jason Wright uh, in a study that he did based on a study that Jill Tartar actually did is they looked at all the SETI searches that have been done and how much parameter space has actually been explored. You know, like, you know, which radio frequencies have we looked at? How long have we looked at? How, what, how often do we look at? You know, the, the, there's this giant parameter space that you're going to have to explore, the, the haystack that you're looking for the needle through. And what they found was by looking at the entire history of SETI is that if this parameter space were the ocean, then the entire 
amount of water that we've looked at, looked for, looked through for aliens is a hot tub, right? So this is like saying, you know, oh, I want to find dolphins. And you look in a hot tub's worth of water and go, no dolphins. Well, that's it. There's no dolphins in the ocean. So there is no Fermi. There's this kind of Fermi paradox. It doesn't exist. Anybody who tells you that does just doesn't understand what's going on. People have this idea that scientists or astronomers every night are looking for uh, using telescopes to look for aliens. But that's not true. There's been no money to look for this. It's only recently because of things like the Breakthrough Initiative, which has been uh, our Breakthrough Listen, uh, which has been so powerful in giving money for to buy telescope time. You know, now we're starting to actually look, but up to now we really haven't looked. All right, so um, I'm going to end there. People can ask me questions about this other stuff if they want. Um, but I'm gonna end with just the idea that there is so much work ahead. This is such an exciting time in thinking about uh, uh, techno signatures and exo civilizations. And that, you know, we're, uh, we're just setting sail on this journey. And in the next few decades, we're gonna have data. We're going to have data relevant to the question of life. I don't know what the data is gonna say, but we're finally gonna have data, which is better than just yelling at each other. So I wanna end just with an acknowledgement of, you know, another pioneer we have to point out is Carl Sagan, who is just all over this story. Carl Sagan was amazing in, in, in and how many, you know, uh, parts of this story his, his fingerprints are on. So I'll end there and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Frank, I think Carl Sagan would have been proud indeed of your summary uh, of the situation in this lecture. And uh, uh, I want to say that this is the last talk of the 2020-2021 uh, school year, but we will be back in the fall. And now we're going to take questions. And as I said at the beginning, um, we encourage you to send your questions to uh, the email address astronomy at foothill.edu. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Matthews, who is the uh, astronomy professor at Foothill College. And he is going to be the curator of the question and answer period. So uh, Jeff Matthews, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Frank, for coming out and speaking with us this evening. That was a great talk. And I would also like to thank all the folks who have been emailing in questions. Um, so uh, we've got a lot that have come in. I'm probably going to do a little bit of grouping when people have asked similar questions. Jeff, I'm and... going to just break in. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Frank, would you stop sharing the slides? And that way we can see you in larger detail. All right, good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, um, so, so there were several people who were asking questions just about the nature of life, right, and how that might affect our searches. So, um, so several people asked uh, questions related to sort of finding ecosystems. So, so with one person saying, uh, "Life is never a singular example, but a system." You know, so, so what is like a minimally functional ecosystem? And I think I'll, I'll add on to that question, you know, how could we search for different types of ecosystems? Well, that's really what we're searching for. That's what biosignatures are about. Biosignatures mean you're not searching for like, you know, a, you know, a, a little green man. Well, you know, let's forget about civilizations, but we're not searching for like, a, you know, a plant. What we're searching for are entire planetary ecosystems. It's the planetary ecosystem which pumps the the gases the chemicals into the atmosphere and we're using the atmosphere as a life detector so what we're doing is is we are it is the sum total of ecosystems that we're actually looking for you know we, we can't we're not going to be able to see the plants or the microbes we're going to see the effect of the plants and microbes on the atmospheric composition got it so so not seeing the life directly but its effect otherwise. Right. Okay. And so then um, there was a, a question, what about things that are really different? What about the possibility of intelligent life that's not, you know, like biological organisms even, you know, that's maybe like robots or that's, um, you know, even in just some other form that we haven't thought of? Well, that, listen, I mean, that, that, that's a great question. And, and, you know, there's a certain way in which you got to begin with what you know, 
and then try and work your way out from there. But, you know, as I always like to say, aliens are not magic, you know, um, they're going to obey the laws of physics. And, you know, like one law of physics that nobody's ever going to be able to get around is the second law of thermodynamics, which is that, you know, if you use energy, you produce waste. Right. So one of the things to look for, is, you know, whether they're robots or, you know, um, you know, clouds of nanoparticles, if they're using energy, they're going to produce, you know, waste like heat. Um, and so we can, you know, the way I really like to think about the problem is we should be looking for the overlap, the Venn diagram between what civilizations can't help but do and the things that we can't help but but detect. Right. So, you know, any civilization is a system. It's a system. And what does a civilization do? It's a system for, you you know, harvesting energy and putting it to work. That's kind of like almost the definition of a civilization. And so if that's what's happening, then there are going to be consequences um, in terms of things like the second law of thermodynamics uh, in in waste heat, in chemical, you know, you know, entropy, what's called entropy being generated in terms of the different kinds of species, uh, a chemical species. So, you know, that's what we should look for. There, there's, there's no way of getting around certain kinds of, uh, uh, of, of um, consequences of being a civilization. So waste heat is inevitable, and thus infrared <laughs> emissions right, exactly. are inevitable. Got it. Uh, so we got a question uh, from Curtis regarding the pessimism line. So uh, I believe that the early universe did not have much in the way of heavy elements. So until the first round of supernovas started making heavy elements, life as we know it could not have formed. Does the Drake equation take this start time into account? That's a great question. Very well informed question. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, the, the, the first, which is amazing, the first stars form, you know, the first galaxies and form stars form pretty dang early in the universe. So, you know, it's really, you know, with it less than a billion years into the universe's history that you're starting to get the first generation of stars, which then make the next generation of stars, which make the next generation of stars. So, you know, you could try to take that into account that there's not metals until a certain point, but it's, it's really not gonna, it's not gonna change that number, you know, significantly. So, but it's a good question. Okay, and so then, um... Transitioning into the questions talking about like search techniques. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep these grouped up a little bit here. Um, so somebody asked, um, I guess this is referring way back to, to earlier in the talk um, when you were mentioning that radio passes through dust. So are there any other advantages to a radio search uh, besides that the fact that it passes through dust? Uh, you know, I'm not a radio astronomer. So others, you know, a radio astronomer might be able to say other, you know, other other, uh, again, sensitivity also, because you can build such giant, you know, the radio telescopes in general are very, or you, not only can you build large telescopes, you can build interferometers where you chain together lots of telescopes, individual telescopes to get a really huge telescope. Um, so, uh, you know, that is, you know, so that's another advantage um, of radio telescopes as well. Um, so uh, yeah, so that was that was why it was logical in the beginning to start with radio. I mean, there's still radio going on and that's what Breakthrough Listen is about. They're doing really great work with radio. So you should still keep doing radio as well uh, and searching through all the frequencies and everything. But now that we have exoplanets, that also means that we've got a place to look with optical. Um, uh, and we can use the, the, the transmission, the light from the star passing through the planet's atmosphere to do this kind of uh, spectroscopy to look for the, the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Okay, so I, I'm going to cheat a little bit and throw my own question in here on that. So mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned the detectability of CFCs with sort of present or very soon technology, but you, know, you just mentioned like the light of the star passing through the atmosphere, which is this super thin layer around the planet. And so what are the prospects for that detectability? People are already doing it. There's all, there's already, it's called atmosphere characterization. And we already have characterized the atmospheres of, you know, um, of uh, some, some Jupiters and Neptunes. So yeah, I know it's crazy but it works and you know, so I know it, it, it's amazing, right? It's, right, it's this thin veil, but you know, 
it's you, you, you know, you, you get enough time. I mean, I, and obviously what you're going to do is, you know, if you've got a transiting planet, transiting mean when the planet passes in front of the star, you're going to do it. You're going to add that up. You're, you know, every transit, you're going to do it again and again and again and again and again. And, you know, you may have to take, you, you may need like, you know, a hundred transits to build up enough signal, but yeah, you can do it. And, it, and we already know, we already know the atmosphere characterization of some giant planets. All right. So there are several people asking about um, sort of the possibility of techno signatures a bit closer to home. Um, so got a question from Jim asking, um, what does Dr. Frank think about techno signatures on Earth? For example, some of the Navy declassified videos. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, uh, so I just actually have a op-ed I just wrote for the New York Times, which hopefully will be in next week. Um, you know, so those Navy videos are interesting, but you know, the idea that they're that they're connected to aliens is a huge leap, right? There's there's really nothing about those videos and that data that should that that you know that would lead you to say like, oh, it's aliens, right? So, so the, you know, what do we have actually from those videos is we've got uh, a bunch of pilots talking about what they saw, right? Um, and, you know, the problem is, you know, if you look at it, you know, each individual pilot has their own story, but somehow in the public's mind, these all get lumped together. So not every pilot saw the thing doing some, you know, saw, saw whatever the, the unidentified object making some kind of crazy turn. One of them does, but the other, you know, the other one didn't. So, but somehow in the public's mind, every pilot saw the, you know, saw the same, you know, strangely shaped object move in some way that couldn't be possible. So that's one thing to remember. Another thing is that, um, uh, you know, these, you know, uh, so, so the, the first person accounts, right, eyewitness testimony is notorious for being unreliable, right? You know, it's, it's, you cannot use first person, you know, uh, uh, um, testimony to really prove much of anything. And listen, if you really want to know what's going on, you got to use science and science can't use first person testimony because what do you got, right? You got somebody saying, well, I saw something that would look close. Well, how close? Can't tell that from what their testimony is. I saw something move in a way that I, you know, that I couldn't have be possible. Well, how fast was it moving? You can't tell that from a first person. So then what do you have is you have the videos, right? Now those videos already people have, you know, have looked at the videos and, you know, there's been a number of, of skeptics who've like actually taken those cameras and it always seemed to be the same type of camera on the same type of plane. And they have um, they've shown that this, you know, that these effects that seem where the thing seems to be you know, moving very fast over the surface are easily reproduced as being uh, uh, problems or just, you know, uh, uh, effects in the optics of the camera. Right. So right there, there's a there's a plausible explanation, a, you know, a, a possible plausible explanation for, you know, for what's being seen. And the thing about science, as I always like to say, if you want to know something extraordinary, right, there's only one way to go. And that's science. Right. And so, you know, the 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 level if I were to say that I found a techno signature. Right. Let's say I said I let's say I, I claim that I find CFCs on the um, on a planet. I am going to, ex I have to expect the most extreme skepticism from my colleagues as it should be. I am going to have to exhaustively, like for months and months and months, go through every possible way I could be wrong. All the possible errors and all the possible alternative explanations before I can ever say, and anybody will ever believe me, that, um, that, that this is actually a techno signature. This is a sign. So with UFOs, you know, it's got to be the same. If you want to say UFO equals aliens, it's got to be the same process. And it's just not even close. Now, let me tell you what I think they will be from some of the readings I've done. So I've been reading some of the military literature. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, a group of, of military strategists who point out that um, even with drones, even with simple drones, um, you could you know, what you, and, and in fact, you want to do this. If you're, they call it a peer, um, a peer state enemies, a peer state enemy would want to use drones or radar reflecting balloons around these kinds of like, these are military maneuvers that are being done. Why? Because then the pilots see it, the pilots turn at it, they turn on their detecting equipment and those drones can then suck up all of the, you know, they can characterize there's the word characterized 
the 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 uh, electronic emissions that are coming from the plane, thereby giving the adversary some understanding of what our um, our electron our very advanced electronic detection systems look like. In fact, the United States even did this in the 1960s. We actually put up radar reflecting balloons so that Soviet pilots would you know turn to them, turn on their radars, and we could characterize their radar. So that is much more likely. And that is, I think, why the military is like, hey, man, we really got to figure out what this, what, uh, what's going on here. So that is just so much more likely than, um, you know, than, uh, you know, this being aliens. And let me say one last thing about this, because this is my favorite thing. Okay. So what we always hear when we talk about UFOs is like, because here's the question. What, if these are really aliens, why don't they just land on the White House lawn and be like, yo, man, what's up? We're here. And so when you talk to you know, people who are really into UFOs, you often hear, well, they, don't, they wanna remain hidden, right? They, they don't want us to know because we're not ready to know. No, but you really hear this, this is often part of the, um, you know, the way sort of uh, uh, theory, the UFO theory goes. But here's my thing. If, this civiliza if these, are, these are civilizations that can cross the mind boggling distances across the stars, can't they turn off their high beams, right? Like, can't they, you know, if they, and then they want to be, you know, they want to be hidden. They want to be secret. Well, if, if their mission is to, to, you know, to watch us in secret, they're doing a terrible job of it, right? You know, why are there lights in the sky? Why can't they uh, remain hidden, you know, uh, from a bunch of hairless monkeys with, you know, primitive infrared cameras, right? It just doesn't make sense. So that's one of the reasons, there's a bunch of reasons why, you know, I think there's something, I think those, those, that stuff should totally be studied and it should be open and we should do a full scientific study of it. It's worth that. But the, the, the jump to extraterrestrial civilizations is just not warranted. So that's my spiel. I hope that's well, okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in for just a second because I've spent the last week dealing with this issue in the media. And I'll just say for people who are interested in following up on the very smart things that you've said about UFOs, there is an investigator in England whose name is Mick West, yes. M-I-C-K-W-E-S-T. And if you Google Mick West and UFOs, you will come to a series of videos in which he does that kind of analysis that you were just describing. Right. You right. can see very clearly what some of these famous pictures that the uh, media are so gullible about what they're really about. So that's one, one way to show the kind of work that you've been talking about. Mick West is the name. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, no, no, th th thanks for jumping in. Um, so uh, we, we got another question in, sort of continuing with the close to home theme. Um, what is your thinking about Oumuamua? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so Oumuamua, um, you know, I, I think, right, there's been sort of the debate with Avi, and I know Avi, um, Avi Loeb. But I think that, you know, Oumuamua was really interesting because it showed us what a possible, uh, you know, what, what a, a possible target techno signature might be. I don't think there's, you know, the problem with Oumuamua, of course, is, that, you know, it came through and it left, right? And so, you, you know, and it took us by surprise. So we didn't have a whole lot of time to look at it. I don't find the arguments for it being a solar sail convincing. You know, I think it was, it's interesting. There's lots of unanswered questions, but it's certainly not a slam dunk. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, oh, you know, I, uh, you know, I think again, there's more, there are easier, more plausible explanations for Oumuamua than it being a techno signature. But, you know, um, uh, Abi was right to raise the question as, uh, as he did. And that's really what's interesting happening now, just like Jason Wright in the paper about, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the Kepler, the, the uh, boy, boy, I have a hard time pronouncing it. I'm going to call it Tabby star, but it's boy, Boyalian star. Um, uh, that, that, you know, in their paper, they pointed out like, oh, these data, you know, it could be, you know, we have to consider it. So, you know, we have to get past the giggle factor where like we consider the possibility like, okay, one possible explanation is it's a techno signature. And then you do all the work that you have to do to show that, uh, you know, that, that's the, that, you know, that, that there's other, uh, there's other easier explanations, but you know, the idea that, you, that you're going to get laughed at for raising the possibility, those days are over. Okay. Since, since you mentioned Voyage and Star, uh, Thank let me you. find somebody. Voyage. Voyage. Yeah, I, I think. Apologies. I think it's Voyage. Yeah. Um, 
but again, don't quote me on that either. Have more time with the pronunciation. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, so somebody asked, um, how could we be sure that the aliens are not disguising their mega structure using dust? Well, you can't be sure of that, you know, you can't, right? Um, but um, but again, you know, then, okay, now you're starting to do kind of a science fiction -y story that they don't want to be seen, it's, you know, et cetera. But, but you're right, you can't, you know? And so then what you'd have to do is you'd have to look for other traces, other signals, you know? Um, if the, you know, listen, if the aliens were clever, really clever, and they didn't want to be found, they wouldn't be found. And that's just the way it's going to be. Um, so that, that's something that we have to, we'll have to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, we have to hope, you know, the important thing to understand is also what uh, Jason Wright likes to call the mono uh, culture fallacy, right? Just because one culture, one civilization wants to do that doesn't mean everybody will. So, you know, perhaps there are some civilizations that are really determined to not be found. But, you know, um, if there, if, you know, if there are more than one civilization, perhaps the others don't. So that's just we have to hope for in this search. Okay, so I think we've got enough time for a couple more questions. A couple more here. Yeah, um, yeah and so um, we have somebody asking about um, with the with the ice moon being ice moon oceans being discovered in our own solar system. Are there any particular biosignatures uh, for worlds like that? Sadly, probably not. You know, which is which is really interesting, right? We have found. You know, I keep talking about the habitable zone, right? This zone where uh, the temperatures are right for life to form. But actually, you know, the the you know Europa, this this ice covered, yeah, you know, this ice covered moon with a with a deep deep ocean underneath it, uh, orbiting Jupiter, is outside the traditional habitable zone. So that just like you know that adds a whole new layer of complexity to it. And you know, if if so, if there were if there was life underneath those ice, we would not be able to find it from a distance. And so, you know, now you'd have to hope that perhaps if they, you know, if it becomes intelligent in, you know, and build civilization that they would eventually come out of the ice and there might, you know, and they might build, you know, things in space and such. But, you know, for, for biosignatures and techno signatures for, for things that really are under that 10 miles of ice, I just don't see how you'd ever be able to find them from a distance, bummer. Yeah, all right. Um, so, so here we go into our, our final question for the evening. Um, and so uh, the question is, uh, what do you think of the great filter? And I think me, I'm going to tack on to that. I'm going to piggyback on that. You know, is that helpful to us thinking about that? Is that helpful to us here on Earth in any way? Well, um, the interesting thing about the Great Filter, one thing is that it's tied to the to the to the Fermi paradox, that version of the Fermi paradox, which I said doesn't exist. So right now we have no reason to think there is such a thing called a Great Filter because we haven't really looked for civilizations long enough to say that they don't exist. So you know, so the Great Filter is still an interesting idea, but there's no reason to think there is one. Okay, but the Great Filter is actually interesting for thinking for of our own. What's happening to us now, and I, unfortunately I didn't have time to sort of go into my spiel about the astrobiology of the Anthropocene, but humanity is clearly uh, in the middle of an existential crisis that could easily um, uh, mean the end of civilization. It doesn't necessarily mean the end of, of human beings, because that would ask a lot, but this, you know, global, networked, high-tech, energy-intensive civilization is definitely up for grabs with, with uh, climate change. Um, and I've done a lot of work. That was what my last book, The Light of the Stars, was about. I was looking at um, the degree to which uh, an Anthropocene, a era of climate change, may be common for any civilization that that you know emerges and evolves, and one of the things we found in our studies is that yes, it probably will be. You know, when you start to harvest enough energy, you have a climate impact. So, um, in that sense, you know, uh, uh, the climate change and or you know, the Anthropocene may be a kind of great filter that we are right now in our adolescence. Uh, um, you know, as a species, uh, and you know, adolescence is a dangerous transition, but it's a natural transition. And so, you know, hopefully we'll make it through, but it's perhaps not all civilizations do. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we end with the issue of whether there's intelligent life on earth. 
<laughs> uh, and let, let's hope the answer to that is yes. But Dr. Frank, thank you for a fascinating evening. We really appreciate your being with us. Everyone, if you are uh, happy to have talks like this, we encourage you to subscribe. The very same page you're on at YouTube allows you to subscribe and then you'll be notified of future lectures as we put them on. Again, we're going to take a little break over the summer. We'll resume probably toward the beginning of October with more Silicon Valley astronomy lectures. Thank you, everyone. Bye.